I think one interesting topic is is you know while we're talking about these guys selling stock, are they uh, risk off right now, or is it just because they expect capital gains taxes to go higher next year? I, I actually think you know the, the sometimes the simplest uh, you know answer is probably right. I think it's just they expect higher capital gains taxes next year, so. So I, I think sell, I, I don't know. I, I think general consensus from people I were talking to is that it was just a lot of risk off going into the end of the year with the Fed meeting and aggressive, you know, profit taking before the end of the quarter. Um, I think that's probably the simpler explanation. I, I don't know the likelihood that we pass any capital gains reform in this like current climate. You know, it seems like there's a like like the the administration is so unpopular now like uh, biden's uh, uh, disapproval ratings are in- incredible he's like he's like uh, beyond trump i think at this point which is quite the feat um so when the president's like that popular there's a, there's not a strong incentive for people who are on the you know the margins of his party to be like going along with him and passing anything that's even like remotely controversial you know you've got you've got joe manchin and kristen cinema who live in like well, you know, cinema state's pretty purple, but like um, mansion state mansion. is just full, full red. Yeah, and I mean, red is as red as it gets. So. Mansion's president. <laughs> Joe, I don't think Joe's really doing anything. I mean, you know, they have to kind of go to mansion first to see, like, hey, what are you cool with, and then they should, you know, devise their their strategy. It seems like they kind of let the the hardcore extremism of their party, like dictate an agenda and then they like somehow surprisingly get shocked when you know the middle of the road which holds all the power now which is beautiful you know somehow stops it and blocks it yeah i think some of these people genuinely have their heads like so far up their own asses that they're like they 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 don't even comprehend that a lot of the stuff they talk about or think is wildly unpopular with like large swaths of the the population outside of their weird little uh, Twitter DC echo chamber, you know, it's like people are literally delusional. There's this like this like my, mass psychosis going on throughout the entire population, throughout politics. It's it, it's 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 like absolutely nuts to watch. Like people, people are so disconnected from each other and disconnected from from reality and just like very sure that what they think is sort of, you know, the way it is in, in spite of like all evidence to the contrary, if you were to like analyze anything through any sort of uh, objective lens. I mean, this past year of politics has been, has been one of the most spectacular failures I've, I've, I've ever seen, you know, like Biden was coming in w- with a, a vaccine rollout and an economy that had been repressed and in a coma for like a year. And all he had to do is just, all they had to do is just not be idiots. And we would have nothing. Like, 15 percent gdp growth <laughs> you know, it just reopened like, it you could have, could have could have like claimed like the greatest economic growth in history although it would have been obviously like a in in, in genuine uh statement right <laughs> with the last year's Coming gdp growth base. being like negative 20 percent or whatever it was right um but he could have done it nonetheless and probably still would have been effective and they like they, it's like unbelievable like they they just had to not be morons um and I, I, I think for some reason they think that they have this mandate to to all be like FDR and like New Deal Part Two, like you know, like it's like Fast and the Furious sequel, you know, new, it, too new, too deal. And it's just like <laughs> they they didn't have a mandate to do that. I think the rest of the country just didn't want to deal with Trump anymore. They're just like be normal. The the mandate was like be normal, not like we want to do all this crazy shit. Um, but they're trying to push all the crazy shit and it's just like failing spectacularly. It's, it's like, it's, it's quite the sight to see. And you, we saw for the last few years, you know, people, all these academics talking to us about how like, Oh no, there, we're, I know that it seems to you feeble common folk that when we print $6 trillion out of nowhere, it's going to cause uh, inflation. But let me, let me talk to you with my deep, uh, modern monetary economic theories about why that's actually not the case and it's like oh like lo and behold surprise when you print like six trillion dollars it you know t- it turns out there's there, there's inflation and like it's like really amazing to watch people be like dumbfounded at this fact um and it's it's sad too because the inflation is like way lower than it, it's way higher than it actually is because you know the, the cpi numbers they use are totally fudged and they have like some 
three and a half percent uh, rent increase number in there when the number like if you look at actual there's like actual data on this it's like something like 17 percent year over year so we got like actually like double digit inflation we're, we're 20 it's, it's, we're it's 20 percent inflation how could you like exclude the biggest expense out of people's budgets which is housing it seems silly you know yeah, housing it's, it's energy the, and the data and food you know housing energy and food are the top three in, in most typical budgets I think energy had the highest bump. It was like something like 56%. And you could say that part could be, could be transitory, right? Um, you know, food, it, you know, it just depends on how the value chain like breaks out and, and, and what's happening there. But it's kind of odd that they have such a low number and exclude, you know, housing from, from an inflation number. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's not odd once you realize that the point of the figures is not to convey uh, accurate information to people. It's to justify particular uh political agendas right and if the numbers don't meet the agenda they simply just change the way that the numbers are calculated and they just expect the general populace mm -hmm. to sort of swallow it but obviously um people have access to more information now than they did in the, the 70s and the 80s and stuff kind of gets through to people that maybe flew under the radar before with the way information is disseminated now it doesn't all come you know from a high from like two or three sort of controlled well, sort of yeah and or that number things, and they're not stupid that number is hard to pull over people's eyes because they feel it the most it's their it's their rent you know it's their the amount they pay to pay to live and i think um you know when people are trying to renew leases they see it going up they they feel it going up and they kind of call bullshit on on six percent because they they feel it in their in their pocketbook um you know i'm curious about whether these kind of like three projected rate increases next year are going to kind of keep inflation off, um, maybe not from rising as much as it did. Um, you know, we'll see, maybe we'll see some like risk off behavior, maybe not. Maybe it's like risk on again, because you've addressed the inflation concern. Here are these, uh, here's the dot plot of like three interest rate increases now we've addressed your concern now game is is back on yeah well what is what is your take specifically on that um obviously like you said powell at this meeting which was a, a, a huge meeting right the market was kind of waiting and watching this with with you know very intently um and i think we did see a lot of selling going into this meeting as people right. sort of like de-risked after that inflation print you know the, the fear was that the Fed was just going to pull like a Paul Volcker or something out of left field, which I, I didn't think was ever realistic, but still that fear was there. And then Powell, as you said, came back with this. Um, he said they're going to do three rate increases next year. Right. And then obviously the game now is always like, is the Fed actually going to do what they, they say they're going to do or, 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 or they, are they sort of bluffing or is it, is it somewhere yeah. in between? I, it's got to be too, because I mean, you've seen the Mac before and then like literally they're watching CNBC along with us and we're like, oops, we need to pull it back a little bit. Um, we can't frighten the market. We need to keep asset prices and volatility like somewhat, somewhat controlled, which is silly because like it's still astounding to me that, you know, they talked about in the, in the, in the meeting notes that they're decreasing open market operations, right? They're, they're buying less treasuries. They're buying less mortgage-backed securities, but the fact that they are buying tens of billions of mortgage-backed securities every month is like mind-blowing to me. Like you, you can, you can stop that. I think without the market having a freak out, like I think the market would be like, oh, at least they got the message, you know, and, and still show like the steady, but slow increase of, of, of interest rates. But, you know, you have people looking to buy a home and there's not enough supply. And at the same time, you see the Fed buying up mortgages which is crazy like artificially keeping the mortgage rates low it just seems um yeah i don't know seems seems a little out of whack to me and i don't think it would be absurd if they said you know we're going to stop buying treasuries stop buying uh mortgage-backed securities at least ease off the open market operations portion of it mm -hmm. um there was one other thing though i saw is um i guess i didn't expect the crypto markets to kind of see like the the equity saw a bump up after that meeting notes right like okay he's they're decreasing operations they're they're somewhat addressing it but the crypto markets you know kind of fell in the same bucket and to me it's kind of a interesting thing specifically with bitcoin like 
does the market view Bitcoin as this risk on risk off asset? Like when you're risk on, you you buy riskier assets like like Bitcoin, or is it how I view it, which is this dollar up or dollar down asset? You know, where, how are they, how is the market placing its bet? And it seemed like the other day it was a, a risk on. You Did know, you see what happened today? Like uh, in big tech, uh, I mean, demolished. We shaved off probably like a quarter trillion dollars in market cap just from the five largest tech firms. Uh, so what does that mean? Like bloodbath, bloodbath. I think what it means is we're we're still trying to identify the market's reaction to the Fed response. Like we're still trying to identify the market reaction to FOMC meeting. And um, my personal take is that you know in the dregs of the recession caused by COVID. Uh, Powell was saying that we will we will do everything with, within our power to maintain uh, a stimulative environment uh, supporting growth, and I don't see any reason for that to change. Inflation's running a little hot, and I I just don't see them tightening in any meaningful way. Um, so like when I when I see growth taking this big hit, I'm wondering myself like is this is this an actual thing or is this a buying opportunity? And it's been, a, and for context, it's been a buying opportunity every single dip for the last, you know, even including March, 2020, when it got the worst it's ever been. Uh, yeah. But this has been the first, uh, this has been the first dip that was like actually accompanied by like a massive inflation print, right. you know? Right. So I feel like it might be different this time. Um, that's to your point, Nick. I mean, I, I think you have to be a little delusional. And, and I think a lot of Bitcoiners are a little delusional to think that Bitcoin is this like pure uh, inflation based trade, because it's, it's, it's obviously not, especially it especially depends on what your, your, your duration is, right? Like if you're trading over like a shorter time horizon, like the next 12 months, like Bitcoin's not a, it's not an inflation trade over the next 12 months. It's, it's you know, I think it purely falls into the, to the risk on risk off trade and that's why it's kind of been right. so weird for the last year because like it's not really as good of a risk on trade as all all this other stuff in crypto and it's like too short of a duration to like kind of see inflationary you know dollar devaluating uh you know policies have like a real impact on it over such a short time period so i think those people will be proven correct over you know the, the longer haul but everything right now is like very much I think it's very much about the the risk on risk off, and I think so, as so, far as like, uh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, like I got imagine that like, okay, inflation is gonna uh, is gonna run a little hotter than than two percent for the foreseeable future. Like, what's a lot, your a lot hotter? I think. Okay, yeah. a lot hotter, like double double hotter, like whatever. Imagine it's gonna run hotter, like, and then your your move is to hold cash. Like that's that's your play. Uh, well, it's it's not that simple right like there's sort of two competing schools of thought here right one is to oversimplify stuff one is that inflation's so hot that the fed's going to have to raise rates and the other view is sort of that the fed the fed can't really raise rates because then you know we can't service our debt and then we're also going to be like harming like an administration coming into like an election year which you know is much as we sort of hear that the, the Fed is not like a political institution, that, that's that's clearly false if you have like two eyes and a brain, right? Um, I think that the more probable scenario is that we get some sort of kind of dance here. I, I do think inflation is probably going to run so hot that it does ultimately force the hand of the Fed in the short term because it could just it could just get like just way too carried away and have some, you know, really bad side effects right but and, and when that happens like you will see probably like a large hit in in all asset prices that are kind of correlated with that risk on trade um but i do think that somewhere to, to 2018 when we had the the rate hikes and the 20 percent uh, dip and the whole taper tantrum in the stock market yeah. like the, the the market i think is like a crack addict at this point and they're just like they are just so addicted to that liquidity that I, I I think that when things start reversing in the other direction, they will ultimately kind of like, you know, the market will like call their bluff and they, they will kind of reverse back the other way. And it, 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 it it's possible that the next time they do reverse, I, like, I, I don't think we've like crossed the Rubicon at this point, 
Um, but I think that the next time we have a crash and another sort of like inevitable, you know, uh, Fed prop up of the market, that probably will be it. So like I, I suspect we will have a, a nasty risk off event, like maybe sometime next year. I think crypto will do terribly and a lot of people may pronounce it dead. But I, I do think even though that will be short term, like awful for, you know, those those prices, it will ultimately be like long term extremely bullish for for bitcoin it's going to seal the fate of 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 you know all these countries like they're, they're going to have to at some point have some sort of jubilee or or, or reset because i don't really see any other way out of it and if you are able to hold these assets that are like outside of the system that they can't kind of like lump into this reset and control all the pricing on then like that stuff's just gonna that stuff's just gonna kind of moon relative to to, to other assets, I think, but that but that is like a longer time frame trade than I think most crypto people kind of like have in their their brain right now. And for the near future, it is just sort of pure risk, and there is like a great deal of short term risk to that short term trade because like contrary to what like crypto people think, like these massive inflation prints are are not like short term bullish for 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 crypto. Like in in yeah. my opinion. Or any risk asset, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes and back to what you guys were saying last time that, like, essentially all assets, you know, approach a correlation of, of one, right? M mainly because, you know, if, if we have an event like this, when people need liquidity or need safety, they kind of go down that risk curve and, and you see everything have a, have a sell off. But doesn't it make you think, like, Armand brought it up in our uh, group text the other day? He was saying, like, well, why wouldn't I just get rid of all, like, most of my stocks? hold hold the top five you know hold like the blue chip cryptos and ignore the rest like I, I think like stable coins when when you're bearish and high risk assets when you're bullish and everything in between it's like uh sort of like a waste of time are you thinking but, bar barbell approach accept the higher beta and uh if you're emotionally stable enough hopefully see a a, a longer return or a higher return over a medium term that's what I'm positing, and I'm and I'm wondering like how um, sort of like my training, you know, efficient market hypothesis and like portfolio management, how that works into like the current the current state of affairs. Like, because it it seems more and more like what we've been talking about this barbell approach makes the most sense, and uh, I don't think that's like how people are managing their money uh, at large today. Right. I think we should I think we should define the barbell approach. But before we do, the main thing I've been thinking about is just like, how would our future president, Elizabeth Warren, really be handling this if she was in the executive branch right now? She's, you know, she's got I'm a really, plan. I really want to know how she would handle this. Miss Karen, I mean, Warren, um, how how she might approach this. What do you guys think? I like She's that little Freudian there. I like that. <laughs> I, it was an accident. I'm sorry. She's hopeless. Was... She's, the, she's actually the worst. She's the actual worst. And I don't actually want to get emotionally attached to any one narrative, but I can't. She just kills me. She kills me. What's well, the game we said we were going to play? Uh, stupid, lazy, or dishonest? I don't think she's I don't think she's stupid. Like she's an educated person, you know, has intelligent conversations, not that the subject matter is intelligent, but she can like track, right? She's not, she's lazy. not lazy. She ran for president. That is brutal, brutal work to to run for president. So then, you know, the uh the conclusion is that she she's dishonest and she, you know, There's derides a... that we have like, you know, these big banks that are too big to fail and you know they're they're screwing over the little guy and there's not enough transparency and then you have this like alternative system that literally grew like a, a groundswell movement from the people you know not some institution didn't like bestow this new you know financial system upon us it literally grew like lego bo blocks from the beginning and um it's fully transparent out in the open and she just uh you know refused to acknowledge it for what it is and it's kind of uh, concerning uh, that that she at least doesn't seem openly curious. And not only is she not openly curious, but she's going hard against it, which just like if, if we were talking, you know, like one one on one across the table, you'd be like, what's going on here? Like, you're, 
you know, there's something funky going on for sure. I think she gets way too much credit. I mean, I think it comes down to a lot of things that we often talk about. There's, she's not lazy, like in terms of conscientiousness and uh, motivation. She's intellectually lazy, which also then starts to border on stupid. And so what I ultimately see is like someone that just like is bathing in ideology and knows no better and is completely wrapped up in this like self-perpetuating thing where she got caught in the ideology and used to have the self-awareness and ability to think and process ideas and look at things objectively before becoming a sold out fucking dishonest politician and now she's just nothing more than a sold out po See, dishonest I, politician I, 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 I don't buy this like lazy thing at all right and because it, this is why I like Elizabeth, I love that we're all just dunking on Elizabeth Warren there's no person probably more worthy of dunking on I wish point, we could but, show um, the meme you sent in the thread before oh, this, the, by the, the best way. meme I've ever seen like I would love to pull that meme up right now um, put that in the put that in the show notes for people yeah um, yeah so <laughs> Elizabeth Warren is a particularly disgusting person because <laughs> you can't like Wild. attribute what she does to either incompetence or stupidity. Like she's obviously an incredibly smart individual. And, and, and like more to that point, like you don't like, I think a lot of people have forgotten this at this point, but like Elizabeth Warren like years ago used to be like a, a pretty like nuanced thinker. She wrote a book called the two income trap, um, which like examined like why middle class, like, you know, families were sort of like going broke. And it was this like kind of nuanced analysis of how, like once we stopped like having one person sort of in the household as like a breadwinner, it created this like, problem where like all these households suddenly were generating more income and they were like bidding up all these goods even more and so it like just incentivized everybody else to like out of necessity also be like two income households and it just sort of like talks about the you know all the downstream effects of this and it was like it was, it was far from like a like a uber progressive analysis right she used to be like a very nuanced thinker in like a lot of ways like you could go and like read some of her earlier stuff and like come to this conclusion, right? So by all available evidence, she's obviously obviously just like pivoted, then a hard pivot to the to the progressive left, right? But yeah. it's a weird pivot too, because like she it, like this is especially disgusting because she like paints herself as this like a champion of the people, right? And she's just obviously like in the pockets of like banks. She's like she's trying to destroy like systems that are fundamentally empowering to people, you know, to basically enshrine the power of like those privileged few who like control oh, there it is. the money. <laughs> there it is. Yes. Are you guys seeing it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Stephen <laughs> sent this. I already said this to like four people and they all died laughing. So by the way, I meant to mention this to you guys in the thread. I'll just mention it now. You guys notice how the Republican is like this masculine dude with a beard and he's like at least eight inches taller than the democrat and the <laughs> democrat have, looks like and the understand. democrat just looks like a like like a little boy prince you know yeah, <laughs> like you a little know, prancing you know the pronouns there. a little you prancing be, you, prince <laughs> you, you might be reading into this meme a little too much i am so the whole thing is like for those not looking at it they can watch obviously on youtube but it's republicans democrats every race elizabeth warren's parents every animal God, Satan, inanimate objects, chads, virgins, every alien species and every gender all pointing to one thing with their swords. Oh my God, can somebody please tell Elizabeth Warren to shut the fuck up? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how yeah. I don't know how well these memes translate to the uh, to the. Uh, oh, that was well audible, read. Audible, oh, I liked it. Thank you. Shout, shout out to uh, I think I think I stole that from uh, I think I was from Albert Nazarov. On Twitter, I, For, I think, former, uh, former massive chain link pumper, but you know, chain link's not doing so hot, so now he's just a bit of a memer. <laughs> Good for him. Good meme. Dude, she she unlocked the secret in in Washington. It's like whoever you bash the most, it ends up being your your greatest you know donation source and 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 funders. I think you that's know, a if huge you, point. That's a great. It's, point. it's like it's like the best unlock you know in in politics. It's like go hard at the banks, and if you're the bank, who are you gonna give money to the most? To like put them in your pocket. Like yeah. when Mark Zuckerberg was up in front of, you know, Congress and, and the Senate, 
they all knew each other. It wasn't like they all had meeting. They've all met before. Like they've all part of like donations from lobbyists. And, you know, I'm sure it was like, Hey, Mark, going to have to give it to you tough out there, but you know, keep the checks coming in. Um, and that's just how it works. <laughs> that's, that's an L2 that's, unlock. I think that's like a good, like you guys are more into politics than I am. I, I had like an L1 unlock recently. And that was that I, I used to look at these politicians, congressmen, whatever. I looked at them as like, uh, ineffective and like just unintelligent individuals and it's like it's actually the opposite they're actually like hyper intelligent hyper effectual at what they're trying to accomplish and what they're trying to accomplish is like completely self-serving in that they're trying to just get more votes and um w when i saw like the crypto pivot into like the, the, la the latest congressional hearings mm -hmm. and, and how well they narrated like our exact concerns, like they get it the whole fucking time. And like, they're so good at, at, at just like talking to whatever they think is like the, the one that's going to get to the most votes. Uh, these people are actually very good. Like, so do you think they've turned the corner, Eric? Like, do you think that uh, like in general, they're starting to work with the crypto community to integrate more and work toward the direction I think it, like, it, do they un you're saying they understand yeah. where their actions follow suit yeah i mean we're, we're all going to have different takes on this my my, my take wasn't necessarily a conclusion it was just like a thought my thought was that guys like ryan selkis guys like uh our buddy dave hoffman these guys that are like pushing congress people on twitter literally coming after them is having an impact and like, mm -hmm. I don't know what the conclusion is. Like, are they there yet? I don't know. Like, <laughs> is it a majority? I don't know. But like, what I know is that it is having an impact. Like all this work that people are doing and we're, we're on crypto Twitter, we're a part of it. They're uh, definitely listening. They're definitely yeah. listening. I think David well, posted like a, a tweet or a DM the other day where I forget which congressman but it was like, to answer your question, like, yes, we are listening and we are learning listen and we to appreciate it. Like, it was like, huh, interesting. Of course so they're listening. We should it's probably like, have a bit of a meta moment, by the way. Hold on. We should probably have a bit of a meta <laughs> moment, Stephen, to realize, like, they'll also be listening to this. So with that said, well, what would we like to transmit is really take the money. <laughs> Take the money. There, there will be an industry cohort, uh, a lobbying cohort that is more than willing to to donate and potentially on like a single issue type of voter basis. And you know the 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 blockchain lobbying group is kind of like fractured a little bit and and not as big relative to other things. But you know, good lobbying groups uh, provide talking points. They provide ready to go legislation so that the people don't have to do any work. They just copy paste and that's their proposal. That's what good lobbyists do. And then of course they 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 bring funding to campaigns so those people can stay in power. So so take the money. It's it's there. Um, and I think you'll find that you might broaden your base. And in some of these um, you know, upcoming races, it'll be interesting to see if one side or the other can can pull votes. That's one of the most effective ways to kind of like you know, tip, tip, uh, you know, polls and, and, and tip the scales a little bit is if you can, um, you know, pull independence specifically, but also the other side. And I think there's, you know, crypto has something for everyone. And so if people recognize that, take the talking points, take the proposed legislation that's literally probably being emailed to you, you know, this year, um, you know, it, it could could work in your benefit. So that's, this is That's a bit of a side channel question for you, Nick, but you you in many ways over the years have also been like a take the money out of politics guy and have supported particular people that, that <laughs> think that. So I yeah. would just like to kind of hear your updated like position on this, because clearly Touché. it sounds like you're nice. saying there may not that may not be something in the near term future that is like foreseeable or doable. And so what I'm really saying is like, well, work with it, work with the system and take the money is that kind of what i'm hearing yeah i mean it's a it's an uphill battle i mean we saw lawrence lessig try to make a good push you know creating a a, a pack to end all packs essentially and then mm -hmm. you know he had to put himself as president you know and, and his first uh, job would be to you know kind of somehow overturn citizens united through legislation potentially but you know i think that's a tough uphill battle um republicans don't like to go down that route at all uh, because, you know, they, they view it as like uh, some kind of violation of free speech that, that corporations giving money is a form of speech and that it should be protected. 
Um, I've been with, you know, senators and congressmen and asked them directly, like, what, what do you think about this? Is it is it an important issue for you? Um, but it, it's tough to kind of like if you're running in a hamster wheel, like how do you rug pull the hamster wheel off yourself? You know, like they're running in a system that is fueled off of money. So, like, how do you, you know, rug pull yourself? Um, it, it takes a kind of a politician who who sees like is basically committed to falling on the sword and, you know, um, willing to do like a one term kamikaze route, but then you got to rope everyone in, 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 and it's, it, it's, okay. it's tough. Um, I think there's a book called the Lo- lost Republic. I, I have to look it up, but that's by Lawrence Lessig. If you ever want to see, um, you know, the real underpinnings of what moves, you know, legislation through look no further than, than where the, the funders flow. And his main thesis is that, you know, there are 300 million Americans, maybe like hundred million something, you know, voting Americans, but there is actually like something like, I don't know, a thousand funders that actually represent 80% of the funds. And so, you know, they kind of control the dialogue and, and which way legislation goes. And no matter what your issue, the kind of bedrock issue is uh, money and finance. So it's it's definitely a, a, a tough one to beat. So, you know, if you have your issue, you have to play the game, unfortunately. Armand, can I ask you, like, because I know Steve and Nick have been into politics more than uh, you and I have uh, probably in the last, you know, 10 years or so. And we're we're sort of like catching up here, gaining steam. Um, as I'm looking at myself, um, I'm I'm considering becoming this like single issue voter in crypto, like unintentionally. And I wonder, like, how has it affected you as you've been watching this stuff unfold? Have you felt the same way? Are you are you following it like that, or where are you at? That's exactly how it happens, though. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Like that's exactly what happens when we when we form these communities, because we begin to like indoctrinate ourselves in what we feel is like the right way or a healthy way, and we ultimately realize that the survival of our community depends on uh, collaboration and understanding that's mutual, and so we begin to vote the same way and that can cause a problem. So yeah, I totally feel that way. I totally feel like I have no choice but to begin to think that way, vote that way. But I guess just my personal like, you know, take on politics over the years has been like, and I think we we talked about this one-on-one, Eric, is like my life was literally all about avoiding politics to the greatest extent possible. I viewed it as like, I still view it as this incredibly inherently dysfunctional thing like it can never be um, functional in a healthy way at its root it's a game of chess and that game often comes with like very like like chess is great and game theory is great and all these aspects of life are interesting and inherent and innate to like survival and evolution and i get it i understand why we have government i understand why we have nation states i understand all of that and I think to a certain degree it's unavoidable, but it's like this political, the political arena from a, from a different vantage point, not from the vantage point of like a very sort of like, you know, just, just purely looking at politics and economics in a very like tangible, rational way. When you look at it like a little bit removed from the outside looking in from the overview effect, like if I was in outer space right now and I was looking down at this, which I cannot wait to do, by the way, like the overview effect is something that people don't talk about enough. Like if we all could take a moment to just become an astronaut for one day and step back and look at this whole thing, we would laugh at the dysfunction that exists between arbitrary made up lines on a globe on a spinning clay rock in the middle of nowhere. So I don't have a choice. Like my brain is always operating from that place and then trying to make decisions rooted in like, the present day things that you and I and all of us need. So it helps me somewhat. But at the end of the day, when it comes to something like crypto, I see it and I understand the importance of it. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of have no choice but to like rally with the homies and stick with the tribe and like represent what I believe to be a fundamentally revolutionary technology that a lot of people could get in the way of. And I would hate to see that. I would hate to see that. I have a question for now, like Steven and Nick too. Like, uh, this is something I've struggled with for a long time. It's like you can you can imagine politics as like this uh, this thing to fix, and you can have this theoretical uh, discussion on how to fix it. 
but then uh, in practice, you actually have to put your effort towards some activity. And is like, like that activity is like to, it's either on one hand, it's going to be like to best situate yourself within this uh, environment, this ecosystem that like the political uh, powers that be have created, or you put your effort towards fixing the problems. And like when I sit there and think about it, and then maybe take your analogy, like if I'm at uh, looking at the world from space view, I'm like thinking like, well, I, Eric Johansson, little speck of dust, is not going to like change politics. Like the best use of my energy is to actually just best position myself within the framework that exists. Like, what do you guys think of that? Like, uh, how do you actually manage this? Because like, like, we actually like talking about the theoretical as well. Like, what do you do? I mean, look, it's, it's, it's certainly not irrational to behave as you do, but also it's a bit of a problem because if everybody behaves right. as you do, then everybody sort of gets overrun by the powers that be who are willing to actually kind of, you know, yeah. put, put the, you know, put the ax to the grind and, and, and try to do something. Um, I think it's understandable why you just throw your hands up and like back away. But, but also I think people are more realizing more and more and more that like some of these things aren't problems. They can sort of stick their head in the sand and ignore. Um, then they're coming to people's doorstep now more and more and more. And they're sort of not realizing it's a problem until it's, it, 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 it's too late oftentimes. Um, and you, 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 you can't ultimately just, be like, ah, it doesn't matter what impact can I have, blah, blah, blah. Because every, everybody, every little conversation you have with everybody, every little idea you throw out there moves the ball, like, a little bit further. And, like, ultimately, like, you will eventually find yourself in a, an uncomfortable situation that you, 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 you can't get out of at some point when the world is just so completely moved against you that you don't have anywhere to, like, kind of run and hide anymore. Um, and, and, yeah, like, tons of people feel that way. Uh, right now and i'm i'm glad that in, in in crypto people are kind of getting well ahead of that ball and have been for some time like trying to be um proactive about this stuff because like can't really be you can't like fight this stuff defensively i don't think i think you need to like really come out swinging with people um right. and nick i know you 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 made a you made like a nice appeal to elizabeth warren and, and politicians in general but like i, I would make a I would make a different sort of appeal because like, you know, Elizabeth Warren's words on, on DeFi and stable coins, there's like this like sort of hubris in them that like harkens back to this like time that is like soon to be like gone where like government and these like powers that be can sort of like control things, right? There's this like arrogance to think that crypto and DeFi, the, all these things are just like yet another thing that like her and all of her friends and her little smoke filled rooms can like, you know, control and regulate away with like uh, the, the stroke of a pen, you know, and some cash under the table or whatever the hell they do there. And there's this idea that like, you know, they can they can stop this. And what what what, what these people like need to realize, these politicians need to realize is that like, like the, this crypto stuff is not, it, it, it's not optional. It's not like a thing that could or could not happen. It, it is an inevitability. And like, they can either get on board or they will get wrecked ultimately. Right. And they should they should choose why the latter because they, they will get ugly wrecked. they will get wrecked and it would be very ugly it's kind of like uh going to war against ai <laughs> like you might as well integrate <laughs> you might as well guide it you might as well shape it you might as well be a part of it like you really don't want to go to battle against something that doesn't need you like it it, it, it is it's happening with or without you yeah, there's there's no doubt that the government and these regulators can cause serious harm to crypto in, in the short run. There's yep. there's no doubt about that. But this this stuff cannot be repressed no more than you can like repress math. You know, it's 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 going to, the, the the cat is out of the bag. Um, it is it is ubiquitous. It is everywhere that you, you cannot like close that box anymore. And ultimately, if you know, the U.S. and the politicians in the U.S. sort of turn against it, that will be the demise of this country. Like, it'll, we will drive innovation out of the country. We will drive money out of the country. And this type of innovation and this type of money is hypermobile in a way. It does not know borders in the way that prior, you know, money and innovation sort of did know borders. Like, we're entering a more and more and more borderless world. And if, like, we keep governing 
with the rules of the old world where we can effectively just use force to constrain things within our borders and like assert our will that's that's going to be a losing battle in like the next century it's just it's just not going to work anymore so we need to fall in line and figure out how to embrace this stuff and like win or you know we're going to we're, we're going to go down with the ship and you know the right. people like us who are attached to the industry and who got in early and like do have that mobility and that flexibility like we will get off the boat and we will we will go elsewhere and it'll suck for the people who didn't you know get on board this earlier because they will go down with the american ship which would be unfortunate um and i really hope that doesn't happen but it is an inevitability one way or another you know um to, to your question eric i think you have you have two options you know you have one and and Chama said this in, in a video that that uh armand has sent around which is get the money like get as much money as possible as quickly as possible or get the network that has money either way because like the answer is still very simple like money moves policy and you can money also moves politics like it is so simple in the political process like you could talk to uh, a freshman congressman and ask them what do you spend your time doing and they'd probably you'd be surprised to hear that they spend their time cold calling and raising money that is where their job is they are the frontline salespeople and they have to prove themselves the people that rise in the party are you be shocked why aoc like you know, rose to like the ranks in the in the Democratic Party is because she's a rainmaker. She brings in so much money. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you can get the money and use it to influence, it's 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 pretty obviously that the, the rainmakers in Congress and in the Senate are the ones who rise and the ones who dictate policy. People get so confused, like why Trump is still in conversations of the Republican Party when they have like a pretty decent bench to kind of like, you know, pass on the torch and maybe not in his same uh, way, but you know, in in the line of his his policy, it's because he still has a ton of money. Like he can play kingmaker because he has money. So it's really no no more complicated than than get the money or get the network. And then I'd say your second option is is basically to build. You know, you you want the te the technology that we're talking about to advance faster than like some downward spiral that the political process could send us down. And the weakness that the political process has is that it's very slow. So technology can move fast. So you can either advance the technology, advance the people, advance the adoption to the point where, you know, it, it actually influences, you know, you have this like kind of like a uprising and, and common voice that goes across political parties that could actually do it. So, you know, two routes to, to go down, um, you know, but, you know, I, Eric, it's, it's tough to do both at the same time. You kind of have to like, to, to choose, but hopefully the builders contribute and there's good organizers that can kind of do their job and and get into DC and and kind of make some moves that way. Um, AOC, stupid, lazy, or dishonest? <laughs> let's let's play. Oh man, let's uh, play. Uh, oh god, that's that's a tough one because she's she's really stupid in some areas and she's really smart. In some other right. areas, right? Um, Broken brain I, syndrome, or, or she's really dishonest, right? She's either like really dumb about economics, or she's like dishonest and cynical. And I, I could, you know, I could see either. She's she's undeniably she's like very good at PR. She's very. I don't think savvy. she's dishonest. Um, I don't think she's dishonest. I think she's, I think she's a little dumb. I think yeah. she's. Uh, I don't think she's as dumb. I think she's probably less dumb than like a lot of our friends may think she is. I, I, I think she's like far too smart in other areas to be like a really stupid person. I think she is a little bit cynical. I think she is a little hungry for power and fame and yeah. like that sort yeah. of control and obviously sees these opportunities to, to kind of, to kind of seize that. Uh, to, uh, it, it, it sucks that she's like just. Like all these people are sort of it, like they they sort of like prey upon like all these like naive like people they, there's like all these all the people who love AOC they they they, they recognize there are like these undeniable problems need a in the world bucket. you know but like like, like it, it's like the Elizabeth Warren you know the same thing like they 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 use these like very knowingly like dishonest like tropes and talking about like. The, the idea that like Elon Musk is like a freeloader, right? It's so <laughs> stupid. Like the, the only way you can have this mentality uh, is and like a lot of people who are in this camp, like have this mentality. They have this mentality that yeah. money and economic prosperity is like a, a, is a fixed sum game. It's a zero sum game. 
So if Elon, the, the, the logic is this simple. It's like if Elon has all this money, it means that other people don't have the money. Er, ergo, like Elon is bad. He's taking money from other people. That's literally how the thinking goes. And they're like, people like buy into that because it sounds so simple and good. But it's like, it's obviously stupid, right? Because like we, we know. Well, like, I think like that if, one. If there was like a fixed pie, we'd all still be sitting around trading rocks and caves because there were only so many rocks back in the day. Like obviously, Elizabeth Warren like, you is can clearly dishonest. Elizabeth Warren is dishonest, yeah. right? Like she's yeah. clearly dishonest. Let's say, let's say AOC is ignorant. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is probably it's dishonest. blurrier. <laughs> yeah. She's... Can we? Can we like? Oh man. Can we like fundraise like a either AOC or Elizabeth Warren face off against Thomas Sowell? Like, ah, man, I would pay so wow. much money and I would like, I don't know, I'd want to keep that video for, I want, I'd want like humanity to keep that video for centuries, you know, is like to refer back on it. Is he still and capable? Is he still? Is he crushing. Still, uh, he's crushing at like 93 crushing. or whatever. He's still, he's still just giving these smooth. The Thomas Sowell is great too, because you, you <laughs> could like, like somebody like Warren could say like the dumbest shit to him, right? And he just kind of sit back and go like, ah, ha, ha, ha. Well, you know, just like this very gregarious, like, and just like, just dunk on them with like a, the, the smile and like light chuckle of like a warm, like old man, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah he's, he's phenomenal. It's so what beautiful. I... Because he, he, every word he says is just so appropriately selected. There's just enough words. He just, he's so incisive. It's like amazing. And it's, a, it's like a shame that a man like doesn't participate in the social media spotlight because that is everything he's these the, days he just he's the final he just writes boss like he just isn't he the final boss because no pictures on the cover and publishes them you know isn't he isn't he well he's black guy right mm -hmm. is I he know. gay Girl. like like is, no. is he like <laughs> he's like he's the final boss he's impenetrable like you can you can like mm. bring out a 30 second native american and he's just like excuse me like, I cannot there's, there's, either confirm nor deny that he's gay, actually. So right, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Uh, we could we could probably solve that with some basic never, research, but uh, never thought about that. But yeah, for people that um, <laughs> don't know him, fascinating, fascinating thought leader, economist uh, to to really look at the Hoover Institute, right? That's where he's he's out of. He's done yeah, some, Stanford, uh, yeah, yeah, Stanford. Here's and, a good here's uh, a good Thomas Sowell quote to kind of back up who he is. Please. We have I have so never understood errors. why I have never understood why it is greed to want to keep the money you have earned, but not greed to want to take somebody else's money. I love that one. Let's go. It's the like, best quote ever. Is... <laughs> he finds a way to again to Stephen's description, use the words so carefully and precisely and never more than necessary. That is like one of the greatest skills in life. Yes. He he nails it more than anybody I've I've seen lately. And he doesn't convolute yeah. it. It just it's just no specific just to the point. Fire yeah. every time. Yeah. Boom. Fire. There's so many favorite like quotes. Is a good uh, Twitter actually to follow because they just repost a lot of his book, his book quotes. Uh, still to this day, I think the greatest interview that has not yet happened is Joe Rogan Thomas Sowell, and oh. I know that I know oh that God. that's been thrown out there to Joe. So. I don't know. Maybe we get him on. We got to no, find I a way. I want a debate. That's the I want a boss. debate yeah. between between you know someone on the other side, which I think because like, you know you, he's going to just sit seen, back and chuckle. Have you seen <laughs> like if if you go on YouTube though, you can see like old Thomas Sowell debates, like nineteen seventies Thomas Sowell, you know, like young and like infinite swag, and he's just dunking on dunking on like libs, just like absolutely dunking, um, and and and, and these are like. Uh, just that phrase alone is amazing. <laughs> Just dunking on lips. And yeah. for context, he was a hardcore lib himself. He was, he was, he was a Marxist. He was a Marxist. At one point. Yeah. So yeah. was Stephen, by the way, for, for a full disclosure. So was Stephen. And so was Mar I. So was I. Marx Marxist is a bit of a stretch, I was, but I was, I was certainly very I was sympathetic to time. the Bernie Sanders cause. Lib once sympathizer? Oh, yeah. I would have voted for people like Bernie and Karen. Elizabeth? And Oh yeah, yeah. I was lost little lost little <laughs> lib. <laughs> it happens. It happens to the best of us. That's why I think that the beginning of the discussion with anybody with all of this stuff, regardless of I think what I have learned from from politics is that ultimately all we're talking about is like in many ways you're looking at human psychology 
and you learn that the beginning of the conversation has to start with like some level of understanding of the other person, some type of empathy, you're absolutely never going to get anywhere. And that's why nobody's getting anywhere in the discussions that take place in this day and age, especially online or in mainstream media and why trust of mainstream media is at an all time low. Nobody trusts anything anybody says anymore because they say diametrically completely opposite things that just and there's no attempts. There's no attempt to build bridges. There's no attempt to understand. I get it. I get it. I was in that boat where I didn't want a bridge to be formed in my direction. Like I literally my my MO, my modus operandi was like, nope, I'm certain that this is what I believe. Anyone who doesn't believe this is an idiot. Actually, let me take it further. They're a racist. They're they're a bigot. They're all these things. But what's really interesting is you start to grow up and you realize that there's the same dysfunction on both sides. But lately, the dysfunction is obviously more alarming on one. And you don't get as much of that like labeling and hate occurring on the other side. Again, I say this as someone who's a moderate centrist person. I, I don't have any disposition one way or the other. But that is pretty obvious that if you are not completely in the left and you are not fully willing to be indoctrinated and repeat the narrative, you're out. Everybody's seeing that. Like Rogan is an example of that. You're not repeating our narrative. You're out. You're an anti-vaxxer. How many times has he gone on air and said, I'm not an anti-vaxxer? I think a lot of people should have the vaccine. He says it all the time. He says it's a great option for a lot of people. It's a not lazy to, way not to, to bring up the... Uh, are, we nah, doing a great, are we doing a great we, COVID pivot now? Yeah, maybe, maybe. But <laughs> it's, it's just because it's a, it's a lazy way to, to win an argument, right? It's not necessarily like yes. an ad hominem attack, but it's like, well, you're saying oh, things that, that sound like... kind of an ad hominem attack. It is. It's kind of it's exactly like, what it is. Uh, maybe, maybe. I think it's more like a personal level, but it's like, you know, about your character and like, you know, maybe it history. is. It's like you're a racist. You're so a racist. Really it's to, pretty at home. I don't have yeah. to debate like the merits of your idea. They're inherently racist and not they're outside the Overton window. I don't even have to address them. Right. So, yeah. uh, like so much of this boils down to, you know, exactly. Yeah, it's, like, it's a cop out. It is. It's very intellectually lazy. Um, so lazy, but very yeah. effective because people are, you know, most people are just monkeys. They, they really so are. So that's, that's what I learned. Especially people on Twitter. It's just like a giant herd of monkeys just like going along with the monkey herd. Yeah, that's that's what I learned. I realized all I was doing was like using personal attacks without realizing it and not having a debate or a discussion of any kind. I was like, of course no one's going to. People are going to laugh at that. No wonder Thomas Sowell 93 is just sitting and chuckling when people say ridiculous things that are rooted in irrationality and emotion. Because he's like, what conversation are we going to have? We're not going to have a conversation. <laughs> Where do we right. even begin if that's your position? <laughs> like, what do you say to somebody like that? You can't. It's just not possible. Yeah, we've, we've talked about this before where the conversation used to be like if you heard a, a politician uh, you know, say something stupid, you'd be like, screw that guy or screw that one, screw that woman. And now it's changed to like, well, screw you for following them. Like, oh, you like that guy, you voted for him, screw you. And it got personal and emotional. And so, yeah, it, it's definitely harder to have like an intelligent conversation, you know, or at least like a, a high effort conversation where you can just let the the argument, you know, kind of play out. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just it's, realized it's, it's pretty better, but... How about us playing the stupid, lazy, dishonest game? <laughs> and how, whoops. Uh, whoops. <laughs> well, but, you know, it's, well, little... it's just pretty, uh, we're just being fucking children. Um, you but know, how, are we, how are we playing the stupid, lazy, dishonest game? Well, it's just basically like ad, ad hominem attacks against people, but you were just. I didn't. Them. I didn't ad hominem attack. attack them. I explained why what. <laughs> yeah, you did. Is, is you bad. did. <laughs> I, mean, I wasn't like they're fucking dumb. So like, does it mean like? <laughs> like does it mean we can't why play anymore? Because I want to keep playing. No, no, no. Anymore. I think we should play. Who's next? <laughs> okay, stupid, lazy, or dishonest. Gary Gensler. Who's dunking on? Gary Ooh. Gensler. Stupid, oh, lazy, dis or dishonest. Dishonest. Not even close. Like he's obviously not that, stupid. He taught MIT level blockchain. Right. Courses. He's obviously not lazy. He's, he's aspirations to probably be like treasury secretary, and he's made hundred million dollars. And he's like, okay, so he's, he's dishonest. Okay, what's he knows the what he's, he knows what he's doing. What's the I root of his most... dishonesty? Explain it so that we're not just uh, attacking somebody's character. What's what's the root of his dishonesty? The, the root of his dishonesty is that he has arguably the best fundamental knowledge of blockchain of like any politician or regulator that exists out there right 
And he is, in spite of that, like twisting things to sort of serve his own particular ends. You know, let's uh, let's unpack that, though. Like, what is his motive here? Like, why are other politicians looking at him and saying, if only Mr. Gensler would catch up to speed with us? And it's like, wait a second. He's the most educated guy in the room. Because, What's his motive? Because he yeah, wants I mean, jurisdiction over investor protection. Like, that's how you gain clout. That's how you fundraise. That's how you, you know, show off what you accomplish and make the next step. I'm, well, go ahead, Stephen. I cut you off. I'm curious what you have. To say. Yeah, I mean, I think he wants to be like Treasury Secretary. I think he wants to ascend to like the highest levels of power, right? But th this is like another to circle back to Thomas Sowell. This is like another problem with like government institutions in general. It's like they have like a built-in bias to enforce things and do things, do anything, right? Because otherwise, right. the implication is sort of like they shouldn't even exist, right? Like if like you, like bureaucracies that regulate, like want to regulate. Otherwise, like, why are they there? You know, um, there's also like infinite downside for them, like to not regulate something that should have been regulated. And then they, the, 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 they don't bear any of the costs of like not regulating something that sh should be like, you know, or regulating something that should be like not regulated. Um, so there's just like perverse incentives there That's a great and point. like the, the worst the worst part about gensler is that like he talks so much about like protecting consumers and like he like like the bitcoin etf was like such an egregious like non-protection of consumers right he's basically like, hurting a bunch of unsuspecting cattle into a financial instrument that guarantees they're going to lose 10 percent like year after year after year due to the nature of like rolling these futures contracts right and like who profits from this like Wall Street, that's who profits from it, right? So he took a what should have been like a great product that would like, you know, advance the industry and like be good for consumers and turn it into a product that's just like a Wall Street cash grab while talking out of the side of his mouth that like it was for like the good of consumers. It's so egregious. It's so like, right? In the, in, in, I think we talked about this last time too, but like um, he like literally refused to answer under congressional testimony, like whether or not he had read that like Hester Pierce safe harbor proposal. Uh, like, uh, they, they didn't even read it. He didn't even read wow. it because he doesn't care. He just doesn't care. He only cares about what's good for Gary, mm -hmm. you know. And all of this yeah. other shtick is just bullshit. It's complete bullshit. And like, yeah. it, like it, my... it, it's 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 why it's why it sucks that there's like so many people like him in government that aren't elected. You know, we talk about like oh the deep state and all this. It's like. Yeah, it's kind of like a meany term, but also like there's a very real thing that there's this massive amount of people in government who are just either just nominated or like exist or through different terms and never leave that sort of run the country. Like there's been so much authority delegated from Congress to these like institutions mm. that have no answerability to the, the people. And like we wonder why everything is like totally fucked. You know, it's because like voting to a large degree is a meme because like there's all these fundamental things that are so wrong with the system that like no amount of voting is going to like fix some of this policy because like there are these just like embedded individuals and institutions that like control so much of your life that you're not aware of and everybody just distracts you by like pointing at some stupid like boogeyman you know wh whether it's some race baiting thing or other right while like you know the problems that actually like affect your life and like the things that govern those problems just they just keep sliding under the radar and everybody keeps like you know getting rich off of them and then we all just like fight each other over nothing you know and Gen Gen gensler's just like the epitome of this it's just like it's so bad i'm like so upset with it too because it's like it's like such an amazing opportunity for the whole country for everybody in the country and like we're blowing it it was just like completely completely blowing it and like you know, people are getting harmed and it's like good for it's good for like some insiders and like wall street you know and and rant by the way, I just I zoomed in on Steven's screen for that one because yeah. I wanted to see how flush his face was getting. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to see how fired up he was getting. Not like because of my because of, of my Rioja. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to Eric's point, like no wonder a person would just say, "Well, what 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 can I do with all of that?" Like it's such a it's such a normal reaction. Um, but I think ultimately what we're left with is like the impact that an individual can have in a lifetime might feel insignificant, but the effects of that are like a butterfly effect that, that honestly, like who knows and, that, and what that else also, is there to do? 
Like what that else is also, there to do? <laughs> that, that's not as true as it used to be. Right. Because like that was really true in like the 1800s. Right. What the hell could you do? What are you going to send out like a mass telegraph to people? Like but it's, it's no, you're, you're just, you live in the woods. You're disconnected from society. Now that we're all networked and we have the power of media and distribution, like individual people have like incredible amounts of leverage now yeah. that they've never had before. So I think a lot of that way of thinking is like not really relevant. I think like if you actually yeah. want to make a difference, so like you actually can like really move the needle today in a way that you have never been able to before. I, I believe that's literally what we're also doing right now. Like I think having this conversation that we already have anyway recording it and one other person hearing it and it potentially having some sort of change impact effect to me it's like boom worth it like that that in and of itself just fulfills me because i really do think that that's that's what we're sitting on yeah. with this type of media and this type of exposure and to your point Stephen, of, of what's possible yeah so just create memes yeah yeah Tell memes are cool. <laughs> well memes will communicate far more than we ever will <laughs> Yeah. One meme can come out of this episode. It'll do way more good. <laughs> so true. <laughs>